Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, yeah, before I start, I just want to do a quick sound check. Can you guys please let me know if you guys can hear me? Uh, just let me know if you guys can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good, good. Seems like everybody can hear my voice. So if that is the case, that's great. Okay, so I will end the poll and we can start our section tonight. Okay, so before I start, I just want to do a very quick introduction about our company, okay, Philip Capital, and also myself. So my name is William and I am actually a dealing and also a marketing executive at Philip Capital Sandiram Berhad. Okay, so uh basically i help my clients i advise my clients how to, to to introduce them about futures market about stocks market and everything about trading okay so before i start tonight okay before i start tonight just a quick disclaimer whatever that i share tonight is only for knowledge sharing purpose and is not a buy and sell call okay so start off with our company in case some of you here are very new to our companies so Philip Capital, we actually, we are incorporate on October 1995. So we have been in the market for a very long time. Okay. And we are a subsidiaries of Philip Capital Holdings, Sandiram Berhad. Okay. So we are a subsidiaries of Philip Capital Holdings, Sandiram Berhad, which is our mother companies. Okay. So previously, our company, we call ourselves Philip Futures because we only futures we only offer futures trading during that point of time but since october uh august since august last year we we take over alliance bank uh stock blocking business and we rename and rebrand ourselves as fully capital sandiram berhad which is a multi-asset class broker okay so with that we are trading participants of busan malaysia derivative Bahad and also a participating organization of busan malaysia securities Bahad. so with that we have this cmsrl license to be a legal broker in malaysia to offer derivative trading and also securities trading for all our clients okay so our company fleet capital we actually have 11 different branches across malaysia at different states as you can see on the chart here okay and our headquarter is based in kl somewhere near to klcc okay if you are not aware of that, of that okay so if you are our clients here i want to uh say a very big thank you to you okay without you we won't be able to achieve this so we these are all the awards we have got over the years from busan malaysia derivative okay so we have been a very aggressive uh very popular uh, brokers in the derivative space okay in Malaysia but starting uh, August last year we have been offering stock broking services so hopefully in the coming years we, you will see us getting uh, awards as a participant organization which is the securities segment okay so next will be our global network okay so our mother companies our mother companies philly capital is actually from singapore okay we are a singaporean companies so our mother company we actually establish offices across all these countries so we have network at over 14 different countries okay so with that we don't only offer product from malaysia okay we don't only offer products from malaysia but we offer products from all over the world okay we offer products from the u.s exchange from the hong kong exchange from singapore exchange from the u.s exchange you know etc etc okay so that is basically all about our company okay background now i want to tell you about our trading platforms and also the products that we offer okay like i mentioned we are uh, we start off as a futures broker okay so what is futures basically futures allows you to trade agriculture allow you to trade indexes metals like gold and silver you know energy like crude oil interest rate which is something that has been in the spotlight recently the interest rate futures okay so if you are monitoring the interest rate in the united states and you are interested to trade the interest rate okay you can contact us okay or you can contact your dealer to let them know uh, to let them let you know about the interest rate futures okay interest rate has been very volatile very attractive to trade lately and the margin is really small okay but this is not our focus today so our focus today is equities especially malaysia equities okay so 
for equities, we actually offer stocks from Malaysia, from US, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia. Okay. And lastly, we offer contract for difference. Okay. So if you are new to the derivative, okay, contract for difference is actually a leverage trading that you can trade BUSA stocks and US stocks or even US indexes at a super attractive leverage. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details about CFD, but if you are interested, again, you can contact your dealer or you go to our website and contact us. Okay, I'll let you know more about it. Now, why trade with Philly Capital? First of all, like I shared earlier, we are an award-winning broker. Okay, second, we, are, we offer 24-hour support. So if you are trading the market during the midnight and you have difficulties, problems, you can always contact us. Okay, and the third one, we offer advisory services and letters market updates exclusively for our clients. Okay, and like I mentioned, we have, uh, we offer products from all over the world. Okay, so with that, we, we of course we we have definitely have a product that is suitable for you to trade. Okay, because we have a very wide range of product and account opening. We do have online account opening, but at this moment, we only have. Uh, derivative futures account opening that is online okay we are working on on stocks account opening okay that you can do it online okay so if you are new to the market and you want to start off on how to track stocks how to track futures you can always contact us to have this one-to-one -one coaching session with you okay one of our dealers will definitely be more than happy to do that okay and we have seminars and webinars going through every month okay so every month we have something similar like tonight okay free seminars and free webinars okay and lastly account opening for futures is free of charge okay you just need to uh, uh, scan this qr code if you are at home you want to open the futures account futures or cfd account you can scan this qr code and then you can fill up your details and you can open the account at the comfort of your own house okay now trading platforms so for futures trading we offer uh Philip Nova for our clients to trade. Okay, so Philip Nova is a very user friendly futures trading platform that you can trade both foreign and local products under one single platform. Okay, you can buy and sell directly from the chart as you can see here. And we have over 90 different indicators that is definitely something is there for you to use. Like, huh? Okay, and for stocks, uh, for stocks, okay, this is the platforms that we allows that we allows our clients to trade. Okay, so for this moment, because we are still new to the stock blocking business, so we are offering two different platforms. One for local stocks, we call it Flip Track, and the second one is for foreign stocks, we call it Ponds Global Malaysia. Okay, so we at this moment there are two different platforms, but in the coming months, we are going to combine two platforms into one single platform. So basically, you can have access to local Malaysia stocks and foreign stocks under one single platform. Okay, it's very user friendly. So that's all for our companies and our company's background. Okay, so tonight I'm going to go into <clears throat> the topic, which is evaluating stocks using fundamental analysis. Okay, so what is fundamental analysis? So basically, when we talk about fundamental analysis, right, we are not able to skip the financial statements. So there are three main financial statements in the annual report, which is super important for us to look at. Okay, it's very important for us to look at. So the first one is the income statement. The second one is the balance sheet. And the third one is the cash flow statement. So later on, I will zoom into these three statements and go through one by one with you guys. Okay, so from all these three statements, okay, three statements, we will use the key figures inside to do some calculation on the key ratios. Okay, so this is important because if you just look at the key ratio and you don't know where does all the figures come from in the financial report, it's very hard for you to understand what does the ratio means, okay? What information does the ratio actually give you, okay? So with the key ratio, we can use it to analyze which stocks has the best fundamental for you to invest, okay? So basically, this is what we are going to, to run through tonight, okay? If I am too fast, maybe you can type in the in the comment box, okay? So I can slow down a bit, okay? So because tonight we are going to go through some figures here, okay? I hope all of you is able to focus because there are a lot of figures going through tonight because, yeah. Now, let's start from the profit and loss statement, okay? Let's start from the profit and loss statement. I'm not sure how many of you here are actually having accounting backgrounds and stuff. 
okay if you are not okay this will be something new to you okay so first of all what is the profit and loss statement so profit and loss statement is a statement that shows the profitability of a company over a period of time so for example we ourselves we as an as an individual we are making money right we earn a salary if we invest in properties we have our rental income you know so our salary and our rental income is kind of like our profit and what is our loss our loss will be our our outflow so what is our loss let's say we have commitment we need to service our lawn we need to pay for our family's food and accommodation you know traveling uh, our insurance do those are our losses our expenses so our income minus our expenses it turns out to be the the profit you know the, the balance so this is profit and loss statement okay so just now I mentioned as an individual level. Now we look at companies level, okay? Because now we are talking about companies. So revenue is similar to something like the input. So when we work, this is something like a salary, our rental, you know, et cetera, et cetera. These are our revenue. And the cost of goods sold is something like, for example, if today you are a trading company, you buy, you buy a calculator and you want to sell a calculator. So your revenue will be your sale and your cost of goods sold will be the cost of you purchasing that calculator for sale okay so after you deduct your cost you get your pro gross profit okay so you see i highlight the gross profit because gross profit is something very important for us to look at when we analyze the profit and loss statement okay now remember gross profit is important huh? okay now after we got our gross profit right we have our operating expenses so what is operating expenses Operating expenses is like you need to pay your salary for your workers, you need to pay for your transportation, you know, you need to pay for, you know, everything like your rental, your electric bill, you know, everything, all the expenses, all the overheads that we call operating. So after you deduct that, definitely every businesses, we have loans as well. We borrow money from the bank to do our business. So we need to deduct the interest. Okay. Why I put it separately and didn't lump into it is because when your company, right, that you invest have very very high debts definitely you see a super high interest expenses here so if you are a dividend investors right definitely investing in high debt company will not give you that dividends you know it's very hard for them to pay you dividend when they need to service very high interest basically the company that is super with super high debts <clears throat> they kind of work for the bank okay so how do you see whether they work for the bank you need to look at how much is the interest expenses versus your gross profit you know how many percent of the gross profit actually has been used to service their interest you know this is interest not even paying the principal is the interest so it's something very important for us to look at especially if you are a dividend investor okay then you get your profit before tax after you deduct your tax then you get your profit after tax or the so-called net profit okay so hope everyone is with me to understand the profit and loss statement. So after we understand the components of the profit and loss statement, right? Now we look at the figures. We focus on the figures that is important in profit and loss statement. Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> this is Hennigan Malaysia Berhad. Okay. So this is Hennigan Malaysia Berhad annual report. I cropped it from Hennigan Malaysia Berhad annual report dated 2021. Okay, so if you look at it, gross profit, okay, you look at this figure, gross profit is important, okay, it evaluates how much profit is left after deducting the cost of goods sold. So how you get the gross profit margin. So every time, right, when we want to understand something, we need to calculate the percentage. The percentage is what is important because percentage is something for us to do comparison. When you want to compare company A with company B, we compare the percentage. So how we calculate the gross profit margin we take the gross profit which is this figure we divide with the revenue we directly divide with the revenue then you get your gross profit so the higher the gross profit the profitable the companies okay remember that the higher the profit gross profit margin the more profitable the companies now the second one is the this one this is the the net profit okay but in annual report they always call it uh profit or total comprehensive income attribute for the year okay owners of the company means who owns this company okay whoever that is the owner of the company this is the net profit so you need to remember this particular word this particular statement is actually referred to net profit 
every annual report, write their net profit in this manner. Okay, so you just need to remember it. Lah. Huh? Okay, so this net profit it evaluates how much profit is left after deducting all your business expenses. So after you deduct your rental, after you deduct your employee expenses, your, your electric bill, etc. etc., how much is left? So how you calculate the margin? Again, you directly take this figure, net profit, go back to the revenue. You see, gross profit margin, also gross profit with revenue. So you get your percentage. So usually companies with very high net profit ends up with higher net profit, okay? So higher net gross profit margin end up with higher net profit margin. So the higher the net profit margin, the profitable the companies, okay? So remember that. Now, the third one that's important is the earning per share, okay? This is called the earning per share. So earning per share basically evaluate how much money a company make for each share of stock, okay? So meaning to say that, right? Usually, companies with super high net profit doesn't mean that you can get very high earning per share. It depends how many shares is there in the company. For example, a company, I'll give you a very, very simple example. For example, company A made 100 ringgit, but there are 10 shareholders. So everybody get 10 bucks, right? Now, company B, maybe they made uh, 200 bucks, but they have like 40 shareholders inside. Everybody, how much? Everybody only get 5 bucks. You know, company A less profit, but less shareholder end up with higher earning per share. You see, the higher the earning per share, okay, this is important, ah, because the higher the earning per share, the higher the dividend payout. Because usually how much companies, how much dividend the company decide to pay, depending on how high is the earning per share. Okay, how high is the earning per share. So this is important as well. Okay, this is important as well. So in short, there are only three figures. There are so many figures here in the profit and loss. Only these three figures are important. Okay, only these three figures are important. So now, since we know these three figures are important, let's do some comparison. So how do we compare? Okay, how do we compare? So first of all, you look at this one. This is Hennigan. Okay, second, this is Carlsberg. So Carlsberg and Hennigan, they are both like Abang Adek, you know? but brother and sister kind of companies, okay? They are very, very similar business, selling similar product, everything is similar. So we can do comparison. So how to compare? First of all, look at gross profit. Remember I tell you just now, we need to convert the figures to a percentage as a margin. So if you look at this one, Hennigan gross profit margin is 30.32%. Carlsberg is 29.55%. So which one has higher? This one has higher. So I put the trophy here, means this is better. Second, remember this one I say, usually higher gross profit margin, usually I'm not saying every single time, but most of the time, company with higher GP margin will end up with slightly higher MP margin, net profit margin. So if you look at this one, uh, for Hennigan, the net profit margin is 12.4%, but for Cosbert is 11.2%. So if you look at this one, which one is better? This one is better. Okay, this one is better. Now the third one is the earning per share. So if you look at Hennigan, right? If you look at Hennigan, the earning per share is 81 cents. And, and then the Carlsberg is 65 cents. So meaning to say, if today Hennigan is going to fully pay out the dividend, right? You get more money out of this one. Or even let's say the company is paying out 50%, you still get more out of this one. In terms of money, uh, when I say more, I'm not referring to the dividend you are uh, not your interest return or your dividend return. Uh, I'm saying in terms of money, you know, this one you get maybe like 50% payout example, you get 400 bucks ringgit. This one in 50%, you only get 300 ringgit, you know? So it really depends what you want, okay? So this is a figure for you to look at if you are a dividend investor, okay? Now, we have settled the profit and loss statement. It's very simple. Now we move into the balance sheet, okay? We move into the balance sheet. Again, what is a balance sheet? So balance sheet is a statement that reports a company asset and liabilities. So what are the components? So the, this one is simpler because there are only three components. The first one is asset. We need to minus the liabilities and then we get the total equity. So total equity is something like your net worth. Okay, let us put this into our individual situation, you and me, okay? We go and buy a house, okay? We buy a house. The house market value 500,000, but we this is 500,000, okay? 500,000, but we, we take out a bank loan, maybe 300,000. So here is 300,000. So how much is our net worth? 200,000, because that 200,000 is the cash that we pay 
to buy this house of 500,000. Okay, so this is our net worth. Okay, so this is our net worth. So basically, balance sheet help us to look at what is the current situation of the company's liability, how much asset they have, how much liability they have, and then how much net worth they have. Okay, this is how we always judge an individual as well. Wow, you're very rich. Huh? How you look at it? Oh, you have house, you have you know land, you have big cars, and what? You don't even have debts. Huh? You buy everything with cash. Huh? People say, wow, very rich. You know, this is how we look at people. And this is exactly how we should look at a company, you know? Wow, well, no liabilities, very rich, very good, you know? So this is how we should judge a company as well. So start off with total asset. Well, total asset, right, is asset, everything owned by the companies. Examples, equipments, properties, cash in the bank, your inventories, your track receivable. So track receivable means you sell something and then the people own you money. So they are you. This is an asset because people own your money. You know, you need to collect it from them. Okay. Second, we go to liabilities. So liabilities is something that uh is owned by the companies. Okay. Oh sorry, this is asset owned by the company, and this is uh this is not owned by the company. I think I typed something wrong. Lah. This is something liability is something that we own people, you know, the companies own the other another party. Okay, example, bank borrowing. Companies own money from the bank. Okay, trap payable. We need to pay our suppliers. Okay, so we own people money. Okay, this is liabilities. So after you this minus this, this is the equities. Left over of the asset after deducting the liabilities, which is our net worth. Okay, so this one balance sheet, nice and simple. Everything clear? Okay, then we move on. So uh, now we move on figures to focus in the balance sheet. After we understand what is asset, what is liabilities, what is uh, equities, now we look at, you see, so much figures. When you flip into the annual report, right, there are so many figures. So what are the key figures? So if you are not an accountant, you don't need to look at everything. Okay, if you are not an accountant, you don't need to look at everything. You just need to focus at the figures that I just highlight right now. Okay, first of all, cash. This is super important. Okay, cash is important. So. When we talk about cash, right, you need to look at your bank borrowings as well. Okay, so if your cash in the bank is more than the bank borrowing, we usually call this kind of companies a net cash company, or we call them the cash cow. You know, usually when people say, wow, this is a net cash company, how do you justify that? You just look at the cash in the bank. And then you minus the bank borrowings. This is the borrowings. You see, some companies they use the word bank loan, bank borrowings, you know, yeah, bank loan and borrowings, whatever. But they are all the same thing. Okay, you need to look at this one, borrowings. Okay, so when people say this is a net cash company, how you go and verify? You look at cash minus this. Okay, so if the borrowings is bigger than the cash. Then we call it a net debt company. So in this case, Henneken is a net debt company. Okay, understand? Huh? Then the second one, we look at the asset. Okay, this is the total asset. This is important. The third one is the net worth of the company, which is this one. So basically, net worth means you take the total asset, you minus the total liabilities, you get this one. So this figure, right, must be positive. Huh? This figure here must be positive. Moment you get a negative figures, uh, you go into PN17. Uh. So recently, if you have been monitor the market very closely, you will realize Farmer Niaga has been going into the PN17. Why? Why? Because their equities go into negative. How is that possible that a company is going to have a negative equity? It's like negative equities is like you basically go bankrupt, you know. If you are an individual and your, your liability is bigger than your loan as an individual. Huh? For example, you own the bank like 1 million, but your asset only have like after minus everything, huh? the asset, the collateral that you have for the bank huh? is only like 500,000. Basically, you, you will go bankrupt, you know, you will go bankrupt. So what happened to Pharma Niaga is that they do a provision uh, of their vaccine or whatever, and that provision basically turn this equity into negative. So moment you go into negative, Busa put you into PN17. So pay very close attention to this one. You don't want companies with very low equity, which means that 
your debts and asset, your total liability and asset is already very, very close. Uh. Usually companies that the debts, the total liability and total asset is very, very close. It's very, very easy for them to become a PN17 companies. Okay, so pay very close attention to that. Although we don't get it every single day, but at least you have a look at huh? So this is something important. And the, 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 the next one, bank borrowings, okay? So basically this one I explained many times already is the money that you own the bank, you borrow from the bank. And lastly, the total liabilities, okay? So this total liabilities is a figure that can be used to calculate uh, the debt to equity ratio. So why debt to equity ratio is very important, okay? Do you remember just now I, I told you that how to, how to prevent a company to be to, to look at a company when we look at a company we want we don't want to invest a company that has the potential to turn into a pn 17 company okay we don't want that first of all you need to make sure that the total asset and total liability are not too too similar uh, you know if one to one now uh, moment this liability go bigger than asset you go into pn 17. second you can just calculate this one the debts to equity ratio means that your liability, it, it helps you to see how many percent is your liability, total liability over the equities. Okay, it helps you to see how many percent. So why this figure is important? Because when your liabilities is already like three times, four times, five times, six times, it's too big. Huh? It's very, very hard for this kind of companies to get loan from the bank. You know, it's going to have, you see, a high debt to equity ratio means the company may have a harder time covering its debts or raising funds from the bank. So we don't want companies with very, very high debts to equity ratio, okay? So how do you judge whether the debts to equity ratio is high or low? I think different industry, different sectors, they have a different kind of level of debts to equity ratio. I'll give you some example. Uh, properties related companies, usually they have very high debts to equity ratio because they need a lot of money to do business, you know. You want to buy land, it's expensive. You want to build something first, it's expensive, you know. They need very high debts, you know. So usually the way that you compare, you should compare within the same industry. So for example, you select five companies from the same industry, you go and calculate all this ratio. You go and calculate the debts to equity ratio. So usually when you look at, you compare five different companies in the same sectors, you know what is the good and what is bad. The highest definitely is the worst. Lah. The lowest definitely is the best. You know, So you at least you get your benchmark for that particular industry. You go and pick the top five. Usually the easiest way, if you ask me, you go and pick the top five or top six of the market cap. And if you like small cap, you can put some small cap in. Maybe two from the big cap, two from the mid cap, and then two from the small cap. So you get six companies, you do your own comparison for you to understand all the ratios within that industry. Okay, this is how you learn, how you do your homework on fundamentals. Okay, now, after we understand what are all the important figures, now let's do the comparison. Okay, we do the comparison. Okay, so how to compare your balance sheet? Again, just focus. There are a lot of figures. We don't, we ignore them. We just look at the figures that is important to us first. Cash and borrowings. So we start off with Hennigan. Okay, we start off with Hennigan. So just now, we see bank borrowings. For Hennigan is 160, uh, 160 million and the cash only 76 million. So this is the net debt company of 83 million. Now, what about Carlsberg? So if you look at Carlsberg, right? Okay, you need to pay attention. Uh. For Carlsberg, they have non-current liabilities. Okay, under non-current, they have loans and borrowing of 5 million. Okay, 5.5 million. Under current, they have bank borrowing of 33 million. So what is non-current? Non-current means that this loan, right? Non-current means this loan, Cosbert don't have to pay in the next 12 months. They call it non-current, okay? If it is under current, means that Cosbert needs to pay this amount in the next, within the next 12 months. They need to settle this amount in the next 12 months, okay? So why, why is it important for us to look at it this way? Is that if this current uh, is way, way, way too high, uh, then maybe it's a problem for the company to service lah. especially after you look at the cash flow statement which we will cover later then you will have a better idea because this amount is something that the bank needs to pay in the next 12 months if they don't pay this basically they will get sued lah, you know the, the default we call it the default already 
you know. So this figure is important. So if you look at Carlsberg, right, 33 million plus 5.5 million, and then you see the cash, 75. So you take your calculator out, you take your calculator out, 75 of cash minus 5.5 of the bank loan, minus 33 million from the bank loan, you get a net cash of 36 million. So you see, I put a trophy here. Carlsberg has higher cash level than the Henkel. Okay, so this is how you do comparison. Now, the last figure here is the total liabilities. Okay, this figure I used already. This asset just now I mentioned already. You know, now we look at debts to equity ratio. So if you look at Henkel, right, the debts to equity ratio is 1.75 times, means the total debts is 1.75 times of the equity. So this one is 1.75. Now, what about Carlsberg? Carlsberg, they have the debts to equity is 1.8. So which one is higher? Usually this one is higher. We don't want it to be too high, you remember? But 8.88 is totally fine. You know, when I mean high, I am like your debts is like five or six times more than your equity, then that would be a problem. Okay, that would be a problem. But again, it depends on the industry. So the best way for you to know what is the high and what is the low is you go and do a, a checkout throughout the whole industry. Like I said, you can pick two from the big cap, two from the mid cap, two from the small cap. Then you have a very good idea what is the, the good debts to equity ratio among this industry. Okay, so this is how we do comparison for balance sheet. Okay, all good. Then we move on to the next one, which is cash flow statement. So this is the last segment that we are going to look at today. Okay, so what is your cash flow statement? So cash flow statement is a statement that allows you to look at the inflow and outflow of the company. So it helps you to see the money coming in and money coming out. You look at the net profit, right? The net profit can be very, very high, sky high, very good money, growing profit or whatsoever. If your, your customer is not paying you money, uh, if your customer is not paying you money, uh, no matter how high is your profit, your company also go bankrupt, okay? Also go bankrupt. So this is important. We don't want just high profit companies, but we want very strong cash flow companies, okay? I put in another words for you to understand this, uh, in another context as an individual us. For example, your company is paying you a salary of maybe uh, half a million a year. You are getting half a million a year. But your company is not giving you the money. They tell you this is your salary, blah, 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 but they don't pay you money. You know, you don't get your paycheck every month. Maybe for the next six months, you also don't get your paycheck. You are still working. But another person, his salary is only maybe 100,000 a year, but he get his paycheck on time every single month. So who is, who is richer? Is the first sample people that earn 500,000 a year but not getting the paycheck or people that earn 100,000 but getting your paycheck every single month. Who is richer? Definitely the person earning 100,000 because he is getting his paycheck. He pay his bills, you know? So he has a stronger cash flow. So remember, high profit doesn't equivalent to strong cash flow, okay? So what are the components of cash flow statement? First is the operating cash flow, okay? Second is the investing cash flow. The third one is financing cash flow. Okay, so what are all these? Okay, let's look at the operating first. Okay, you look at this one. Huh? So operating cash flow, okay, operating cash flow is money the company spend or the company, the money the company made purely from business activities. Okay, purely from business activities. So for example, if you are a trading company, for example, you are manufacturing companies, all your manufacturing business, your cash receive, your cash outflow from manufacturing will be booked under the operating. Okay, now what is investing? Investing is money the company spend to gen uh, from investment. Okay, it can be, for example, if you dispose an asset, you dispose an asset, you dispose uh, your, let's say your, you have a piece of land in your company, you dispose it then that money will not appear under operating because operating is purely for you to see how the company performs from the business perspective. There is no other noises, purely business. Very good, you know, we know how the company performs purely from business perspective. Then all your investment, uh, 
this one you sell property la, will book under here la. so it don't disturb your operating okay it don't disturb your operating so investing it also can it also allows we as an investor to see how much the company actually spend every year in the business you know how much they spend to upgrade their equipments how much they spend you know to on capex to increase their productivity etc etc all the investment were booked under here so this allows us to see whether the company actually even spend money on upgrading their equipments and stuff in in capex capital expenditure okay so this is important as well and lastly financing cash flow this is also very very important because how much usually when we say financing is that when company paid dividend were booked under here how much company repaid the bank loan were booked under here how much company borrow from the bank were also booked under here so this financing cash flow basically allows investor to see the money in and out from the bank and also dividend to the investors okay so very important we don't want a company that have that basically you know survive the operating and investing purely from this one it's like this one very low this one very low but this one suddenly very high and the money is actually getting from the bank usually if you see something like this continuously for a few years this kind of companies you need to avoid okay you need to avoid because at some stage might turn into a very very high debt company and become the like a slave for the bank lah. you basically work for the bank and use all your profit to service your interest like a slave okay now lastly free cash flow this one is super important this when we look at cash flow statement right this is uh, the exactly one that we really really want to look at okay so free cash flow is operating minus investing you get the free cash flow okay we don't want companies with no free cash flow if you're, you get negative free cash flow, meaning to say that basically your operating business, your pure business, your core business is continuously making losses. Okay, your core business is continuously, although your profit very high. Actually, if you if you look at a company's recently, uh, Servac DK. Okay, if you go and look at Servac DK's annual report, you will realize their operating cash flow is not enough for them to cover the financing to cover the investing you know it's not enough they survive best from here you will see very big positive figure here and very small positive figure here so if you see something like that right basically it tells you that the company survive on debts we want to avoid this kind of companies okay companies that survive on debts okay so the best way to avoid it is always having free cash flow you don't want to over invest until your core business cannot sustain you know so how you look at it this minus this la, easiest okay as long as this minus this is positive basically to me it's good enough okay it's good enough but of course the bigger the figure the best it is okay now we understand the whole cash flow statement let's look at the key figures okay figures to focus first thing the net cash from operating activities okay so this one is operating remember just now i said as long as this one is positive it tells you your business your core business is really making money positive money inflow 339 million money inflow this is amazing you see money the company generate purely from business activities a positive figures means the company have positive cash flow from business a negative means the company have negative cash flow from business activities so this is important we want very very high this figure you see compared to 2020 this is like big growth you know we want this very big growth so this is good okay second we look at investing okay so this figure if you see uh you see net cash use in they put a bracket use in investing means the company overall invest like if you look at this one acquisition of pr property plan and equipment so over the years they spend 98 million invest in properties plan and equipment okay what is it you need to go to not 10 to see if you are hardcore enough like if you want to like if you don't want to doesn't matter just look at this one if you are hardcore enough you go to notes number 10 in the annual report you go and see what are the things they look at like. okay so if you are not then just look at this one good enough okay this negative no problem but this you you just make sure this is sufficient to cover this one like you don't want to over invest like 
like you earn 10 ringgit, you invest 20 ringgit. Next year, you earn 20 ringgit, you invest 30 ringgit. In the long run, where does the money come from? The money definitely comes from financing. You get the money from the bank, you know. In the long run, if you always get negative free cash flow, you definitely get your money from the bank, okay? So if you get it from the bank, then this figure will be positive. If this figure is positive, I don't like it because it means you get money from the bank to support this, to support the operating. So I don't like positive figure over here. Okay, not a big fan. Okay, so how you look at this one, you see, over the years, the company paid dividend 199 million. Okay, and you see this one, repayment of revolving credit and trade financing. So this is bank loan. They paid off 89 million of the bank loan, you see. Okay, if you look at previous year, 2020, I give you another example here, just for you to understand. Okay, if you look at it, over the years, you see, they, give, they, they have a drawdown of revolving credit, meaning during the year 2020, positive figure, you see, this is positive, means during the year, they actually borrow 152 million from the bank. They use, they borrow money from the bank, but this one they repay already, you see? So it's good, it's good, you see? So overall, because they paid 199 million of the dividend, the cash decreased a bit, lah, okay? You see, after investing 100 million, after they pay almost 200 million, they still get a positive cash. They all, the, the cash in the bank only reduced by 50 million. You see, that's very good. You see, this is the kind of companies you want. If you want to have a company that really can give you consistent dividend. Okay, so look at this one. This is leftover cash for the year after investing in financing company. Okay, so a positive means company has positive cash inflow. For this case, it's a negative. So negative means company over the year has a negative cash outflow. Okay, so at the end of the year, the money in the bank of the company after all the business, all the hustle actually reduced by 55 million. Huh? But anyhow, they, they return 200 million to the investors. Okay, so how do you compare? Now, how do you compare? First, we directly look at this one. Huh? That's how we understand what are the important ones, how we compare. So first one is operating. So if you look at this one and this one, which one is higher? Hennigan is higher than Cosford. So I put a trophy here, 339 million versus 275. Second, we look at investing. Okay. Now, the third one, we look at financing. But remember, all these figures, we don't compare itself. We, the main purpose of all these figures is for us to calculate the free cash flow. Okay. So what is the formula of free cash flow? You take operating, you minus investing, you get this. Okay. So this minus this, you get 238. This one is 228. So which one has higher free cash flow? Hennigan. So I put a trophy here. Okay, this is how you do comparison between different companies. So now we have gone through the profit and loss, the balance sheet, and cash flow statement. We are clear. Now we use all these figures that we just mentioned just now to calculate the key ratios. And today I'm going to cover the P ratios, the return of equities, the net tangible asset, the dividend yield, the dividend payout ratio, the gearing, and also the free cash flow. Okay, we use all those figures that I that we covered just now to calculate all these things, okay? So how do we start off with PE ratio, okay? This is price earning ratio. So I think many of you actually really understand this one, okay? But I believe some of you, you always, you only know PE high is bad, PE low is good. I think a lot of new, new investors, people that are very new to Busa market, you only know that PE high is bad, PE low is, is, is good, but, do you understand what is the calculation? How do you calculate PE? You know, and what is the meaning behind PE? So basically, PE ratio allows you to calculate how many years you require for you to return your investment. How many years require? Okay, come back to our real individual cases again. Okay, for example, today you or me, we invest in a property, one million. Okay, and this property is going to generate 100,000 of rental one year, every year. So how long for me to return the investment? 10 years. So the PE, the price to earn is 10. This is how you calculate. Okay, this is how you calculate. So the PE is 10. So now, assuming there are two different companies in the same industry, or even three, why people always choose the lowest one? Because they think that is these companies, okay, they think that these companies requires require lesser year for them to return their investment but always remember uh, 
P ratio, how high is the P ratio really depends on the market. Usually high growth company have very high PE because people have very high expectation. And low growth company usually have lower PE because people don't have much expectation. So it really depends. You can't say PE too high, no good. Lah. But at least later I will share you something for you to judge where is high and where is low. Okay, later I will share you. Now, second one, we move on to return of equity. I think I'm going to overshoot a bit five to 10 minutes today uh, because yeah, maybe I am, yeah, content is a bit too much, okay? So let's move on to ROE. I will try to speed up a bit, okay? So ROE, the formula is net profit divided with total equities, okay? So ROE basically allows you to, to evaluate the efficiency of the company using their resources, okay? So I give you some, again, Okay, it allows you to evaluate how much money the company generates with the amount of resources they have. I give you another example. For example, today I have 50,000 in my pocket and you have 100,000 in your pocket. Okay, I have 50, you have 100. But when we go out and use my 50, you use your 100,000 to, to try to do business. For me, I made a profit of 100. You also made a profit of 100. So who is more efficient? Definitely it's me, right? Because I use 50,000 and earn 100,000 and you use 100,000 to earn 100,000. So definitely I am more efficient. So I definitely have higher ROE. My ROE is two, your ROE is one. So definitely I am more efficient. So this is, this is the, the, the concept behind ROE. The higher the ROE, the more efficient the company using their resources, okay? Using their resources to make profit, okay? So that is why people always like high ROE. Among the same industry, people will choose the, the highest RE because they think they are the most efficient in terms of using their resources, okay? Now, the third one is the NTA. So NTA means you use your total asset, you minus your liabilities. So when you minus this, you get what? Your net worth, your total equity. So you take your total equity, you divide with number of shares, means how evaluate the value of the company based on its net asset. So it, it tells you how... If you buy this a share, how much is the asset per share? Okay, so this one, usually how people look at it is that uh, this is a bit similar to price to book ratio. So basically, when the share price, when you buy the company, the share price is lower than the NTA, means the net asset, okay, net asset. If the share price is lower, people will always say, wow, this company very undervalued, okay? But to me, uh, lower than share price is not always the good benchmark for you to decide because again, if you go and look at all the properties company, right? Every single company in the properties sector, okay, you look at the property sector, majority, I will tell you 80% of them has lower share price. The share price is lower than the NDA, but are they good to invest in the current market environment? Is property stocks going to shine now? Okay, ask yourself. The NTA is definitely way higher than the share price, but are they good to invest? You know, this is, but this, of course, again, this is a good benchmark if you think the company has the growth, has, uh, you see the growth in the company, you see stable dividend, or you see, you know, you see some value in it, then you can use this to, to help you to pick like among the same sector, to help you to pick, okay? But again, not every company's the share price is lower than NTA, it's good, huh? pay attention to that, okay? So after, after that, you look at this, uh, you can count your dividend yield, okay? You can count your dividend yield, okay? So this dividend yield is a very good benchmark for us to invest because we want, when we invest, we want to have very good return, okay? But again, one of the things that I will really suggest you to use NTA, one of the sectors, like, oh, me, myself, I really will look at NTA and dividend yield together is risk. Okay, at this moment, if you go and look at all the top tiers REITs, right, like Pavilion REITs, Sun REITs, you know, the YTL REITs, you know, YTL basically owns most of the Marriott in Malaysia. And, and if you look at Marriott, right, all the traveling, the tourism are coming back, but their NTA, the share price is currently like 90 cents, 90 cents ish, but the NTA is 1.6, you know, it's like the NTA, the asset itself is deeply under under the sh the uh, the share price is deeply under the asset value okay under this kind of circumstances is it going to be good like i said is property going to be good now ask back your this question is it going to be good 
is the dividend going to increase moving forward? If your answer is yes, then is the growth there for the next? I, I don't want to say 10 years. Uh, since we invest, we invest in a shorter to mid, mid term. We look at a time frame of two to three years. Do you think YTLRE is going to give you increasing dividend over the next two to three years when the hospitality, the traveling sectors coming back? Okay, is it going to be possible? Okay, if your answer is yes, then with this kind of price to book value, asset is 1.6, share price is 90 cents. Is it a good investment? Ask yourself. I'm not telling you, but you go and ask yourself. Okay, so you can go and check all these kind of things. Again, same for pavilion rate. What is the dividend yield of pavilion rate? Go and count and look at the asset. I think these two are one of are, are, uh, are two of the most important thing for you to evaluate REITs. Okay, it's not every day. If you look at over the past five to eight years, you really, really see top tier REITs trading below the NTA. Almost impossible in the previous five years before COVID. Five years before COVID you will not see top tiers read trading below the NTA. Okay, that is totally not possible. Only after COVID. So pay attention to this kind of stocks, you know, that is deeply under the NTA just because of the COVID and they are not recovering, maybe because of the high interest. But if it is because of the high interest that they are not performing, then is interest going to stay high forever? If your answer is no, not going to stay high forever, then moment the interest rate reverse, all this thing is going to go back to its NTA or even above its NTA. Okay, so you should, this is how you use fundamental analysis to evaluate a sectors. So if you really want to evaluate, you need to pull out all the stock within the same sectors and evaluate. Okay, lastly, this tool is dividend payout ratio. Okay, dividend payout ratio. So for this one, you evaluate the generosity of the company. So it depends how many percent. Lah. Some company that earn one ringgit, they give you one ringgit. Some company that earn one ringgit, they give you 80 cents. You know? So you count the ratio again, the percentage, then you know how generous is this company. Lah. Okay, so lastly is the, uh, this is not the last, this is gearing ratio. So gearing ratio, remember, this one I told you, I like companies, when I look at gearing, right, I'm only referring to cash and bank over the equities. Okay, so for this one, gearing allows you to evaluate the financial leverage raised by the companies over their equities, the net worth. Okay, how much is the leverage over the net worth? Okay, so a very high gearing means the company is less flexible during economy slowdown. Okay, for me, if I am a dividend investor, I will focus on a gearing ratio that is below one. Okay, so when you this minus this, divide with this, I like it to be below one. If it is more than one, uh, the interest means the company need to work harder for the bank lah, to service the bank interest. Lah, oh. So yeah, that is basically the meaning behind gearing ratio. And lastly, this one, I think I explained it already, is the net cash flow. Is this operating minus this, minus this, okay? But the important is free cash flow, the operating minus investing, okay? So free cash flow is extremely important as it measures the company's ability to meet their debts. Okay, so financing cash flow allows investors to see whether the company survives on debts. Okay, so just now I mentioned, lah, we look at this and this to make sure we have positive free cash flow and financing is just for us to double check whether the company actually survives on the debts. Okay, now how to use key ratio for stock pick? We are almost there, just give me another 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, this is how we do comparison. Lah. Okay, so you list down all the ratios, you list down all the ratio. Actually, all this ratio, right, you don't have to calculate yourself. Just now, I'm just trying to explain the logic behind every single ratio. Okay, I try to explain the logic behind it. But if you want to get all these figures, just go to KLSE screener. You basically, you can, they already calculate everything for you. So you just list down. For example, today, I use something that every single person can understand. Let's say growth. So you want to see which one is a better growth company. You list down all this ratio, then you put down. Okay, uh, top growth, Tata, Supermax, you know, comfort. You list down, then you 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 list down, and then you eventually which one is the thing that you think is the most important for you as an investor. 
because different time frame request different different things whether you are a dividend person you know and stuff so you put all this trophy then you see which one has the highest trophy you know this is one of the easiest way if you are a new starter if you just started to want to learn how to do fundamental analysis this is one of the way for you to start okay for you to do comparison among all different companies within the sector then you can do a comparison like i said you can create two big cap two mid cap and two small cap so at least you you know lah, what is the difference between each industry okay so for this one share price okay we start off henneken the share price is 28.5 houseberg 23.5 so the pe both are the same so nothing to compare roe this one has higher so this one is more efficient okay so nta this one is higher so this one is better dividend more or less the same because the share price is not cheap okay not cheap so 2.8 percent and your bank fixed deposit is four percent do you want to invest in this or you want to put your money in the bank okay bank four percent risk free this one 2.8 percent you need to experience the up and down lah. so it depends so yeah you can wait if you know how to count you can wait okay so dividend payout ratio definitely Hennigan, they almost pay out they earn one buck they pay you 99 cents this one they earn one buck they pay you 85 cents okay gearing this one is net cash definitely better free cash flow this one higher definitely better but they are quite similar so not not so much important okay net cash flow when you have free cash flow of 200 million to me net is not so significant anymore okay because your free cash flow is very very strong okay so this is how you do comparison so okay now how to identify undervalued stocks that's why we talk about a lot about using ratio understanding now we talk about undervalued how do we use fundamental analysis to identify undervalued stocks okay four things i look at okay four things this is these four things is the easiest if you are a beginner in the in the stocks market for fundamental these four items is the easiest way for you to start to identify undervalued stocks first PE ratio, it must drop below the average or historical low. Second, price to put value must drop below average or historical low. And the dividend yield, it must be a historical high. And fourth, the company must have growth. This is the most important also, uh, and do not survive on debts. If the company survives on debts, you know, lah, survive DK, survive on debts, and Pharma Niaga, the you know, lah, once the asset and liability are too close, a big a big provision you go into pn17 okay so how do we look at this this tree first of all you can use trading view to identify the high and low of p ratio okay you can use trading view you just go to trading view you search p ratio you get this so if you look at henneken right over since 2016 the high is like almost 50. so if you see pe is this high you go and chase ah. Huh? Then likely you 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 it's possible you chase into the peak lah. There is a risk lah. You see here to here you need to experience lah. So when we try to invest right, you draw a line over. So if you invest somewhere lowest, your risk definitely minimized. Okay, but again, is there growth in this company? When you think is down here, ask back yourself. Is there growth in this company? If your answer is yes then you can start to accumulate a bit a bit uh, and also dividend if it is important to you okay dividend is very subjective uh, some people focus it some people don't so ask yourself okay second price to book value again trading view already plot it all up for you just go to trading view you search price to book ratio it tells you so if you want to buy right somewhere here you see here price to book value is at the lowest already uh, here you buy definitely you won't buy into the peak uh, right you buy here definitely you buy into the peak you see you use trading view to plot out your two line you try to buy lah. again if it is here ask back your next question do you see growth in this company for the next two years if your answer is yes then you can start to accumulate lah. okay now this is basically it and for dividend you need to calculate yourself lah, huh? dividend you i think do they have it here i can't remember whether trading view i need to check again but if you don't have you just need to know how what are the dividend you you can accept for example one of the way for me to judge is now the bank is offering you four percent so if you want to invest in something that have volatility i think you focus on things that with five or six percent at least additional a bit extra 
and then the company have growth and then the the pe pb is all at the law then go for it you know then go for it okay so something that you can look at enhance okay i call it what are the other things investors can evaluate other than the key ratios the first one we definitely look at the single customer risk okay we want to avoid like, not say avoid if you think these companies that you invest right have single customer risk maybe it's not so suitable for you to make it a very very big weightage in your entire portfolio for example i'll give you one example uh, uh inari if you look at inari right every time broadcom has some news or oh, apple might lose contract from apple uh, you will see inari maybe dropping five to ten percent every time this kind of news come out inari will drop five to ten percent so if suddenly one day uh, broadcom seriously lose apple as a customer Inari were worth nothing, you know. Inari were worth nothing because Inari has this single customer risk, you know. So if you see this client uh, companies that you invest have this single customer risk, you try you can invest. I'm not saying they are not good, they are still good, but try to not make it too significant in your entire portfolio. Okay, you probably allocate 10%, 30% is fine. You don't go up to 50% on these kind of companies, uh -huh. Okay, understand? Then second. You can look at all this information. It's available in the annual report. Okay, you need to know how to find it. Like it's inside there. But today, due to time constraint, I'm not showing you. Okay, you can ask us like if you want to. Second is diversification. So usually in the annual report, right, they will tell you this company, the income derived from which country, which country. So we want the company to have income from overseas. Malaysian market is limited. Overseas market is unlimited. So we want company to have diversification. So two companies inside, like example, Henneken and Carlsberg. Okay. Carlsberg, if not mistaken, Henneken only have business in Malaysia. And Carlsberg have business in Malaysia and Singapore. So which one is better? Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer companies that only do business in Malaysia, Henneken, or do you prefer companies that do business in both Malaysia and Singapore? It's, uh, it's something for you to to, to compare okay and lastly identify the growth engine potentially to boost the upcoming sales so this is always the most important this is like you know the backbones of the share price okay very important so to summarize everything i think we look at profit and loss okay this one i'm not going to go through again because due to time constraint we look at balance sheet okay cash in bank versus bank borrowing liability versus equities okay by the way all these things will be recorded and will be uploaded onto our youtube if you want to reach watch it okay but if you want us to give you the slides because there are a lot of figures uh if you want to read all this again you can send us a message we can email you the slides okay because there are lots of figures a lot of information can be too much like, huh? <laughs> if you are really a new investors in the market okay we look at cash flow we look at the key ratios okay now time for q a do you have any questions and also uh so if you have if you want to open account you can scan this one lah. Oh, so let's start our q a session if you have any question you can type in the comment box and i will try to answer it okay so the first question uh I think Aaron, Aaron asked us whether the recording will be sent to you. Yes, we will. We will upload it onto our YouTube. Okay. The second question, do we use this to compare similar companies? For example, compare all the banks and see which one has higher uh, gross profit and net profit margin and EPS. Okay. For banking industry, it's slightly different. Uh. Banking is a service industry. It's different from Carlsberg, Henneken. They are more into... Uh, they are more into manufacturing that is why you compare it this way if you compare banking right you need to look at different things first thing very important is net interest margin okay so their net profit margin is equivalent to net interest margin meaning how much money they can make the margin between the spread the money that they receive from their client the fixed deposit people place they pay and the money they charge out to the client based on the loan these are the spread in between the higher the margin the better the second one for banking right usually very very important is the we call it what do we call it uh, like the default one you know non-performing loan yeah the official word is non-performing loan so we don't want the bank to have very high non-performing loan because the higher the non-performing loan means eventually the, the the provision for bad debts is going to be very high the default is going to be high 
So we don't want bank to have very high non-performing loan. And the third one is definitely the adequacy ratio. This is super important because adequacy ratio basically tells you whether the bank will go bankrupt or not. If the adequacy ratio is, I, I can't remember what is the minimum benchmark Bank Nagara set for all the banks already. There's a minimum benchmark. This is to make sure the bank will not go into bankruptcy. Okay, so basically adequacy ratio means how much money they borrow out, they need to have how much money in the reserve to, to make sure if the economic crisis come, they can still survive. Okay, so we want to have very, very high of these uh, debts to equity, uh, the, this adequacy ratio. So banking is slightly different. Huh? Banking is slightly different. So the way that you analyze different industry can be slightly different. Huh? But today I'm using manufacturing because if you are new to the market, I think manufacturing is the easiest for you to understand. Okay. Now the next question is by Brahim. Uh, he is asking, Hennigan profit and loss income, finance cost is evasive. What does this mean? Uh, I am not... And I, I don't quite understand what you mean by evasive, but actually, uh, if you ask me, uh, their finance cost is not very high. Their finance cost is not very high at all. If you want to know whether is it high or low, you directly take the finance cost versus their, you can versus their net profit. Okay, how many percent is the finance cost over the net profit? If the finance cost and net profit maybe is like, one to one, uh, then, then definitely that is very high. Uh, you know, the easiest way for you to look at it is you use the percentage. You take the interest payment, the finance cost, you divide with the net interest, net profit. You divide if the percentage is like 10% of net profit, uh, that is okay. Uh, you know, it's normal. It's normal. Okay. And the last, the next one is by Hazlina. Okay, it's by Hazlina. What is the simplest formula to calculate intrinsic value? Okay. This intrinsic value uh, is a very big word, if you ask me. It's a very deep word as well, intrinsic value. This intrinsic value, I think a lot of, we call the, the analysts, they like to use it. But for me, I don't like to use it because I think it's too complicated for us as an investor. We, for me, I just look at what is really important. The free cash flow is important. If I am a dividend investor, okay, I want to focus that I have very high Free cash flow, okay? Again, this intrinsic value, like I said, do you remember just now I mentioned about risk? Okay, I mentioned about risk in particular. At this particular moment, if you ask me, the companies that really have that really good risk to reward, when I mean risk to reward is that when the interest rate reverse, maybe in turn, at the end of 2023, maybe early 2024, when the interest rate reverse, I think REITs will shine. And what is the downside? Okay, what is the downside? I think just now I kind of analyze REITs a bit using the NTA, the dividend and stuff for you to, to really understand it. I think understanding all this ratio and use it is more important for you to really calculate this intrinsic because intrinsic is very big. I think it's usually used by analysts and how they calculate, I don't know. You know, <laughs> Honestly, I'm not a CFA analyst. I am just a retail investor that look at fundamental. Okay, so if you ask me, I won't be very particular about this word, but I will use all whatever that I share you and make sure everything tick my chat box, my checklist. Then I'm happy to go for it. Okay, now next word, NAV. Is NAV same with NTA? If not, what is the difference? Net NAV, I think NAV is net asset value, is it? I think net asset value is more or less the same. Uh, let me see, uh, NAV. I think and if, yeah, it's net asset value. I think net asset value is the same thing as net tangible asset. It's the same thing. It's more or less the same thing. Okay, it's 90% 90, 90 similar. You can just directly use NTA if you ask me. Okay. The next question, uh, when chat, you want the slides? Yes, you can. You leave us a message. We will email you the slides. Okay, next question by Leon Wei Tan. Okay, the question is, the borrowing higher than cash, does it mean it's Bad. Most importantly, is its liability able to pay out the its ability to pay out the debts. Correct. You are totally correct. High borrowing, uh, bank borrowing higher than cash doesn't mean it's bad. No, it's not. It's totally not bad. I'm just saying you, if you are a dividend investor, you don't want bank borrowing to be way too high. Like I said, just now I mentioned one word, gearing ratio. So your bank borrowing 
when your cash minus your bank borrowing and divide with your equity, okay, this is the gearing ratio. You try, if you focus on dividend, okay, if you focus on dividend, you try to uh, find companies that is below one. I think they have a better ability to borrow, to give you dividend, you know, if they are generous enough. If you look at Genting Malaysia, right, if you look at Genting Malaysia, they actually has been paying good dividend, okay? They actually has been good dividend, okay? They have been very good dividend. Uh, if you look at Genting Malaysia, they actually has been paying very, very good dividend and their gearing ratio is actually increasing because of the COVID. Genting Malaysia used to be, before their milk, before Genting Malaysia actually built their king part, right? Their debts to equity, uh, this borrowing and stuff, uh, is like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. But after COVID, after their build, it becomes 0 0.5. Now, after COVID, almost one. If you imagine, uh, getting Malaysia to start with, uh, is the, the gearing ratio is at one. Then after their build, the team part become 1.2, 1.5. Then after COVID, maybe become two or three. Uh, then you really don't expect them to pay you dividend anymore. Even if they do, maybe they borrow money from the bank and pay you. Lah. That is something we don't want. In Mandarin, we call it lao pen, you know, something like this we call it lao pen. And I really don't want to invest in companies that pay you with their reserve. I don't want company to pay me dividend with their reserve. I want the company to pay me dividend with their earnings, their, their operating cash flow is something that they should use to pay me, not with their capital reserve, not with their bank borrowing. So how do you judge that? You go to cash flow statement. You go to cash flow statement. Okay, now. Next question here. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions or a lot of questions. I'm not sure whether you guys want me to, to go through everything or maybe I think tomorrow I will try to I will try to reply all of you one by one. Huh? Those that I have not able to cover it, I will try to reply you guys via email tomorrow because we have been overshoot by 12 minutes already. We've been overshoot by 12 minutes already and there are still a lot of questions. Okay, so I guess if you have questions, you just type in the comment box or something. Tomorrow, I try to reply you one by one. Okay, I guess that is all for today. Okay, and uh, before we finish, just a quick one. Okay, before we finish, just a quick one. Uh, just to let you guys know uh, our social media. Okay, so if you want to know more about us, you can follow us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Telegram, you know, and on, yeah, our website is philip.com.my. Okay. Oh, sorry. This one is mine. Okay. It's okay. Sorry. Okay. So basically that's it for tonight and very thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you for your time. And if you want to know more about stocks trading, try to contact us. We offer very, very attractive brokerage for you to trade Busa, for you to trade US stock. So, okay. With that, I think that is, that is all for tonight. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.